Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Isaiah Kidos. There hasn't been any NBA games due to the All-Star break having just happened, so in today's podcast, we'll be doing a first-half recap. We'll break down the Western Conference and the legitimate teams that could make the playoffs. We'll do the same thing for the Eastern Conference, and we'll talk about how the playoffs might shake out if they were to happen today, and we'll end the show on who might be the MVP. Defensive Player of the Year, Rookie of the Year, and Most Improved Player. So, we're going to jump into the Western Conference and see how it's shaken out so far this season. And still at number one for most of the season this year has been the Los Angeles Lakers. They've been extremely consistent. They're 41-12. and That's a win percentage of 77.4%. And they've done it on the home and on the road. They actually have a better record on the road. They're 23-5. and and they've just been playing really well. They're on a three-game win streak right now. Um, have a point differential of plus 7.4. And it's largely due to the fact that the Los Angeles Lakers have LeBron James. And even though LeBron's in his, what, 17th, 18th year in the league, another reason why he's playing so well is because he's got a good running mate with him, Anthony Davis, who has been playing some of his best basketball alongside LeBron James. These two as a tandem is scary. Their ability to score and defend consistently and just lock down teams and bully them on the offensive end is a luxury for any team to have. Not to mention the fact that, you know, they have good role players around them. Dwight Howard's resurgence has really brought life into this team. Alex Caruso, a fan favorite that, you know, he's not necessarily um, an eyebrow raiser, but sometimes he can be. He goes out there and he competes hard and then... You have players like Danny Green and Avery Bradley who will shoot the ball from three-point land consistently well for them to be competitive. So they have a lot of good pieces. Kyle Kuzma as well when he's when he's being more consistent. Um, they have a lot of good pieces, and they their biggest thing right now is they want to stay healthy and they want to push for the playoffs because right now they're looking <laughs> they're definitely going to make it into the playoffs. There's no doubt about that. But they want to keep that one seed. That would be extremely valuable for this team. Um, playing on their home court, playing with the crowd at Staples Center. That's something that should definitely be on the top of their list of priorities. Coming in number two right now is the Denver Nuggets. They're 38-17. and 17. Um, In this stacked Western Conference, I definitely wouldn't have pegged them at number two. But the fact that they're so good this young is a great sight to see for them looking forward to the future. They can be really good for the next couple years because of their core. Jamal Murray, he's really starting to grow into his role on the team. Jokic, he was saying himself that he wasn't in his top shape. He's actually lost 20 to 25 pounds on this new diet that he's been uh, he's been on throughout, throughout the season. So he pegs that for the reason why he had the slow start. So when Jokic is healthy and when he's um, in top shape, top form, he can be a player that could be an MVP at some point in this league because he's a walking triple-double. So he's got a lot of potential. Gary Harris as well, one of the best perimeter defenders in the NBA. So they got a lot of great pieces around them as well. Um, A very deep squad. Michael Porter Jr., he's starting to emerge himself. Could be potentially a really good piece for them moving forward if he can stay healthy. That's his biggest issue for sure. But the Denver Nuggets being as consistent they are um, and have just been competing really, really well this, this season so far. And if they hold on to that number two spot, It'd be very impressive to see for sure. Coming in at number three is the Los Angeles Clippers. This is a team that's been 
in my eyes, a little bit inconsistent, but they still post a record of 37-18, and 18, so they've been very good this season, only five games back from the Lakers, and they continuously get better as well. Recently, they've just made a new acquisition. He is not officially on the team yet, but Reggie Jackson's about to be bought out by the Pistons and then be picked up by the Clippers. And there was a lot of speculation in the media that the Los Angeles Lakers wanted that wanted him themselves. Uh, I think they were just kind of hyping that up because of the Battle of LA thing. On and off the court, they want to beat each other. But the Clippers end up getting Reggie Jackson and adding a veteran guard into their lineup. I'm not sure how much of an impact he's really going to have, but the fact that they beat him, beat the Lakers to get to him, is more symbolic in my opinion. I was watching Colin Cow- Cowherd talk about this on his show. The Clippers are building a squad to beat the Lakers, and I think that's a very interesting point. They've beaten beaten them twice already this season. Other than that, the Lakers have been pretty much unstoppable. It's very difficult to beat them, but somehow the Clippers have done it twice, and the Lakers have yet to beat them. So, at the end of the day, the Clippers know that they can turn it on in the playoffs. They can they have the star power to do so. PG, they got Kawhi Leonard. Patrick Beverly, if he can stay healthy, he can help run the offense. He's a force on defense as well. Montrez Harrell and Lou Williams coming off the bench. Both of them could be up for sixth man of the year. I mean, they have all the pieces necessary to go deep into the playoffs. They think that their biggest obstacle, though, is the Los Angeles Lakers. So the way that they're building their squad seems like they're just going to try and beat them. And so I think that's a definitely smart idea for them. They just added Marcus Morris as well, so... They're also they're adding so many different pieces, and I think they can be the most dangerous team in the West if they find the right team chemistry, the right consistency, and if they continue just working on their game because right now they've been injured all year, have had so many different lineups, and haven't found that consistency or chemistry yet. So we no one really knows just how dangerous this team could be. Number four right now is the Utah Jazz. They're 36-18, and 18, half a game back from the Clippers. They had that that crazy run of 10 games where they were just unstoppable. Same time where they got Jordan Clarkson, who has been a really great force coming off the bench for them, but not to mention the fact that their core is really solid. I mean, Donovan Mitchell, um, Mike Conley, and Rudy Gobert, who could potentially be a three-time Defensive Player of the Year consecutively this season. He's their main force on the defensive end. He's the reason why that their defense plays so well. It's because his ability to protect the rim. And then the rest of the players just fall in suit. Donovan Mitchell, he's played pretty well this season. I feel like he has a lot more potential than what he's grown up into so far this season. There's been times where he's dropped his level of play. Um, But when he picks it up and he's playing to his full ability, he can be a very dangerous piece. And this Utah Jazz team can be very surprising, I feel like, in the playoffs. Right now, they'd be, at this very moment, they'd be playing the Rockets, which will break down later, but I think they could be a very dangerous team in the Western Conference, and they have all the pieces to do so. Their biggest thing is just having enough um, offensive consistency to be able to battle out teams and beat them in the end. Number five is the Houston Rockets right now, 34-20. and 20. This team came with a lot of question marks in the beginning of the season, Would the Russell Westbrook and James Harden partnership really pan out? So far, you can't really say that it has for sure, but you have seen flashes enough to where you can believe in it. Because these two, when they're on, they're both dangerous, a dangerous tandem to have to deal with in the NBA. They've proven it time and time again. Um, James Harden, he's averaging over 35 points per game, which is absolutely unheard of. Russell Westbrook, he's really starting to find his role in this team, know when he should be asserting himself on offense, and he's a triple-double machine. So to have a point guard like that who just works and hustles as much as he does, combined with the pure scoring of James Harden, those two can be extremely efficient. And now that they got rid of Clint Capella, they are they are full-on the small ball method. And I think if they can find out a way to master that, and really understand how to play that small ball without a center, they can really be dangerous too. Their biggest thing is beating themselves because those two are walking turnovers as much as they are bucket getters. They do turn over the ball a lot. And if they can't figure out small ball and they they end up getting bullied by players like Giannis, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, so on and so forth, then it could be 
a rough outing for the Houston Rockets, but it does seem like they do have the pieces to go deep in the playoffs as well. Number six right now is the Oklahoma City Thunder. I think they're an absolute shock to be here right now in sixth place. I pegged them to be down in the bottom bracket of the Western Conference. I mean, they lost Paul George and Russell Westbrook in the offseason. Picked up Chris Paul, who was in the lat- in the back end of his career, but he's researched himself as well. He's been playing some inspired basketball this season. He seems revitalized, and he's really in a place where he can really run the offense the way he wants to. It didn't work that well in Houston because a lot of the time the ball's in James Harden's hand. And when Chris Paul is the one in control, in command, things happen really well because he's the last true point guard, in my opinion, in the NBA. And he can run an offense like nobody else. And when you have pieces like Danilo Gallinari and uh, rising star in Shea Gilgis Alexander, Steven Adams underneath the, the basket, they have a lot of pieces to be really well, really good as well. I just don't think they have enough pieces to go deep. But the fact that they have played as well as they have is a testament just to the resilience of veteran presences and just you know the quick rebuild for this franchise as well. Because a lot of people thought it was going to be a moment where they blow it up, use all these players that they have now as, as trade value. Um, but they can hold that off for another season because of just how well they played this year. Number seven is the Dallas Mavericks in 33-22. and 22. They've fallen from grace a bit. I mean, in the beginning of the season, they looked to be very dangerous. They were in top four for a couple weeks there, um, even a month or so. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that Luka Doncic is, is experiencing a fantastic sophomore season. I mean, he's playing MVP caliber-like basketball right now. And then when you combine that with Porzingis, who could be one of the better centers in the league if he could stay healthy. He's had some injury issues. Doncic as well. So these two haven't really had that much groundwork together. Um, but they have a lot of pieces too uh, to be successful. They lost Powell, which hurts a lot for their team. Um, not just you know defensively, but offensively as well, just because of how much he works, the offensive boards he could grab. But you have shooters like Seth Curry, you have Tim Hardaway Jr. And they've got some good pieces. So maybe they can try and make a push with Willie Cauley-Stein, who they just recently picked up from the Golden State Warriors. But without Powell, I think that their depth doesn't shine through enough. Their competitiveness might not be enough, but can never really count out the magic that Luka Doncic brings. So never know with that one. And then number eight, another big surprise, Memphis Grizzlies, 28-26. They're over 500, just recently got over 500 for the first time this year. And it has to do with rookie of the year sensation, John Morant and combine that with Jaron Jackson Jr. and a veteran presence in Valanchunas underneath the basket at center this team is really good and they did it without Andre Iguodala who didn't even want to play for them didn't think they were good title contenders at this point in his career didn't think it was worth it and yet they still seem to persevere Dylan Brooks too just got a three-year contract because of how consistent he's been he's played in every game this season and so this team is really building to the future it's a really young core really really young team I think like six or seven of their players are under 24 so this is a team that's building their experience now and playing competitively I don't think they'll make any noise this year but in years to come they could be a really dangerous team in the Western Conference now really quickly there are other other teams that I think can make the jump to the playoff spot four games back from playoff spot right now is Portland Trailblazers can't ever count out Damian Lillard he's out injured right now with a groin injury um, so maybe it could be showing the fact that he's a little tired. He's been carrying this team, has been going off for the last 10 games or so, and has been the hottest player in the NBA, no doubt. Um, CJ McCollum, his running mate, one of the best backcourts in the NBA. And then you have Hassan Whiteside, Carmelo Anthony, who has found a home in Portland. He's been playing a lot better, has kind of accepted a role, a smaller role, and really thrived in it. And they, if they get you know, Nurkic back in time and they start being more competitive, they could be a really good team, make a push for that last playoff spot. And then another team that I think could raise a lot of eyebrows is the New Orleans Pelicans. With Zion Williamson in the lineup, they're playing at an elite level. Um, They're plus minus when Zion's on the floor is through the roof. And having him just for 10 games has shown just the capabilities of this team with him on the court. And if they can finish the season strong they might be able to squeeze in there right now they're only five games back from a playoff spot no excuse me five and a half games back from a playoff spot so 
they definitely can make that push um, and the Grizzlies could see themselves on the way out but only time would tell so that breaks down the Western Conference coming up next we talk about the Eastern Conference and just who's at the top and who can maybe squeeze in at the bottom Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. back to the GSMC basketball podcast we just talked about the western conference and how it's looked so far in the first half of the season at least pre all-star break and the Lakers are still on the top they've been playing really well this season the pers- the team that could probably combat them the best in the postseason though will be the Clippers they've really st- uh, started to gain some more momentum with them more chemistry they've gained the right pieces um in terms of trade, in terms of pickups, with Reggie Jackson coming on the way. Just got Marcus Morris as well. So they're building a squad to beat the Lakers. And then the rest of the Western Conference looks dangerous as well with the Jazz, the Rockets. Uh, surprisingly enough, the Thunder and maybe the Mavericks can make a push as well. And now moving over to the Eastern Conference, there's only one team that should be at number one at the very end of the season. And it's been the team that's been in first place all season long because just of how consistent they've been. I mean, They've only lost eight games this year. They're 46-8. and eight. The Milwaukee Bucks are dominating teams. They have a plus-minus in terms of their margin of victory at plus 12.1. I mean, that's just unheard of. They're not just beating teams. They're destroying teams. And the reason why is because Giannis Tentacumbo is their leader. He's the MVP of this season so far. We'll get to that later on. But he's just been playing super consistent, and he's the reason why this team works both on offense and defense because he carries them on both ends of the on the court and he's averaging over a double double as well so and then add pieces like Middleton who's a good spot up shooter good catch and shoot uh shooter and then players like Corver who's also a good shooter as well Connaughton you got Lopez and this team has a lot of depth and just a lot of pace as well they're good at pushing the pace they're good in transition they're even good in the half court play as well Um, But I don't think any team is faster, um, more resilient, stronger than they are. And right now, they're the team to beat and the team to knock off. And in second place, a team that's going to definitely push, try to try to push them out of their seat. The defending champions, the Toronto Raptors, 40 and 15. I'm honestly surprised that they've been playing as well as they have this season. Because with the loss of Kawhi Kawhi Leonard, I thought they were going to drop off a lot. But I underestimated the ability of rising star Pascal Siakam, who's been playing really well this season. In the beginning of the season, before his injury, he was playing MVP-like basketball. And he's kind of gotten back to that as well. He's per- he's kind of a player that plugs in to where the team needs him at the time because he's so versatile. And then the consistent play of Kyle Lowry. Even though I've definitely counted him out at times, I think he's a little overrated, but he's definitely been a player that's kind of, you know, teamed up with Pascal Siakam in terms of filling the void that Kawhi Leonard left when he left the team and whatever the team needs Lowry seems to provide there are games where he'll he'll only have like 10 points but he'll still have like 12 rebounds or 12 assists and still go out and get some rebounds too so he can do whatever the team needs him to do and then you add Van Vliet who had a breakout year last year and then you have Powell as well Gasol when he's in his in his top form that team can be extremely dangerous and never count out the defending champions. They were just on a 15-game win streak, so they know how to win games. Kind of when you win a championship, you get that championship DNA. You know what it takes to get there and the level you need to play at in order to consistently prove yourself. And I think 
That's exactly what the Toronto Raptors are doing, and all the people that counted them out, including myself, are in awe and should be ashamed of ourselves, basically, for counting them out so early. Early, They're the defending champions, and they put together a good team to continuously be good. Coming in number three is the Boston Celtics at 38-16. and 16. I think they have a lot of potential to be at the top of this Eastern Conference, and if not this year, then at least in years to come. They can be a really great team. Jason Tatum, a budding star, his third or fourth year in the NBA. I believe it's his third. Um, but the the longer he's been in the NBA, the better he gets. There are some games where you know he'll disappear from time to time. But for the most part, he's been the most consistent on this team. Alongside Kemba Walker, who when the Celtics picked him up, I thought this was a fantastic move for them. Losing Kyrie Irving does kind of hurt, but I think Kemba Walker in a lot of ways can be an upgrade just because of his personality of the kind of person he is not all those that drama that was surrounding Kyrie Irving is there Kemba Walker just goes and he balls out that's all he does then you add Jalen Brown who's really establishing himself he loves all the haters and 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 consistently wants to prove them wrong and then you also have Marcus Smart coming off the bench so they have a really deep squad I didn't even mention Gordon Hayward who isn't necessarily back to the best of his abilities that he was at when he was on the Jazz and before he broke his ankle for the Celtics in his first season, but he is kind of getting back to some solid numbers, some good contributing numbers. So this team has a lot of pieces, a lot of depth that can really push them to be one of the better teams in the East and definitely make it to that Eastern Conference Finals for sure. Coming out of number four, probably the biggest surprise for me in the Eastern Conference is the Miami Heat. They're just such a tough team, and they've drafted really well. Um, and then it also the revitalization of Jimmy Butler's career. He is another player that just plugs into whatever the team needs him to do. He doesn't necessarily always put up superstar numbers in terms of points, but he'll go out and get you the boards that you need. He'll assist. He gets it done on the defensive end, too. He is just a straight competitor. And then add that with Goran Dragic, who's one of – you know the best one of the best point guards in the league in the last few seasons he's coming off the bench now because you have Kendrick Nunn you have Tyler Hero both players that are rookies and playing extremely well Hero's an absolute flamethrower from three-point land and then Bam Adebayo the biggest surprise for me he's really started to figure out how to be a great big in this league I mean he got his first all-star appearance he also won the skills competition so clearly he's got a lot of ability with the ball as well and he's just a, such a force. This team is so tough. And, you know, that's the reason why they've been as good as they've been. And they've had a record of 35-19. and 19, And they just find ways to win. They have such a great home record, record as well. They just don't lose there. They're 22-3. and three. And, you know, they're a team that can be a surprise this Eastern Conference. Definitely a wild card in my book. Coming at number 5, 34-21 is the Philadelphia 76ers. Injuries continue to plague them. It's been tough for them to get any traction, really, because Joel Embiid, their biggest star, in my opinion, consistently gets hurt. Just little knocks and bruises here and there that makes him miss two or three games here, four games there, you know, five games here, and they can never really get their footing. And I don't. And I think a lot of uh, the issue too is that they don't have an identity offensively. This is what Joel Embiid said himself. That sometimes he doesn't know whether to go down low or to clear out the space underneath the basket and stretch out you know, the floor. And I think for them to really gain the right momentum and chemistry that they need, Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid need to complement each other better. Both of them like to be inside the arc playing their post moves and drive into the basket, whereas you need more spot-up shooters. I think Tobias Harris can be a really good piece too. Um, but he doesn't score consistently enough to to really push this team um, over the edge and make them just that much better. And, yeah, so like I said, mostly injuries are plaguing this team. Al Horford as well, who could be one of the better centers in the league, just doesn't mesh well with Joel Embiid. He's been moved to the bench now. And so they have a lot of things they need to figure out. But they do have a lot of talent, a lot of capabilities to be really dangerous in the Eastern Conference. So only time will tell. Indiana Pacers come in at number 6, 32-23. They've been, always been the dark horse team in the Eastern Conference, in my opinion. 
Um, there have shown flashes this season of being one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference, um, but not consistently enough. They've been um, playing really well, and then they got Victor Oladipo back, and they kind of went on this losing streak, their largest losing streak of the season so far. And if they get Victor Oladipo back to playing to his highest ability, they get him in tune with their rotations, their chemistry, their movements on offense and defense, then they could be a really dangerous team because Sabonis is another player who's one of the better bigs in the league. He was in the final of the skills competition against Bam Adebayo because of he's an elite passer. He's good with the basketball. He can score too. And then TJ Warren as well having a great year and they just have a lot of pieces to be successful malcolm brogdon as well so the pacers aren't six right now but they can definitely make a push and be higher in these standings no doubt especially with the sixers being inconsistent and who knows if the miami heat will be uh as consistent they've been all season long coming in number seven is the brooklyn nets the bottom two of these this playoff picture to me don't really seem relevant the top half of the Eastern Conference, including the fifth and sixth seed, are definitely the storyline for me. Um, but coming in number seven is the Brooklyn Nets. Kyrie Irving's hurt again. His shoulder has continuously bothered him, and he seems to be an extremely injury-prone player. And obviously, they don't have Kevin Durant yet. Uh, did see a video of him pretty recently, um, and he looks pretty good. But he's not to that NBA level of competition yet, obviously. So when those two get together and they're healthy enough to be putting together 80 or so games then maybe they can be a force but with the team that they have right now of just Spencer Dinwiddie, Karis LeVert, uh, Joe Harris they have good pieces DeAndre Jordan they have good pieces but they don't have enough star power to make a push to be dangerous in the Eastern Conference yeah I think they can make it into the playoffs because they're in that seventh seed right now pretty comfortably but I don't think they'll make any noise, really. The eighth C is is the same situation for me, Orlando Magic. And I think the eighth seed, honestly, is just up for grabs for anybody in the Eastern Conference um, because all the teams underneath sixth place for the Eastern Conference are not super competitive teams. The Orlando Magic do have Aaron Gordon, who was cheated out of the dunk contest, let me remind you, in case you didn't hear my rant last podcast. But... They don't have one of their best players in Jonathan Isaac. He's out for the season with an injury. And they just don't have enough pieces. Markel Fultz is having a great season um, with this team. Kind of revitalized his career as well. He was a number one pick, did nothing for the Sixers, and then kind of has started to reestablish himself on the Magic, gaining some more confidence. But like I said, star power is a big thing in this league. And when you have teams like the Bucks, Raptors, Celtics, Heat, Sixers, and Pacers above you, it's going to be tough for you to make any kind of noise without any real star power. The Washington Wizards, if they get John Wall back, they can be really good. Um, but I don't know if they have enough either. Bradley Beal, who's someone who should be an all-star in this league, wasn't, but can be. Um, yeah, if those two, if him and John Wall get playing together again, they can be really good. But other than that, I don't think they have enough to really make a push. And then underneath them, Chicago Bulls, Charlotte Hornets, Pistons. I don't think any of these teams will really make a push into the playoffs. So I think those top eight will probably solidify themselves unless somehow the Wizards make a push to push the the Magic out in the back half. But I think that's pretty much how the Eastern Conference is going to shake out. And so coming up next, we're going to take a look at how the playoff picture would look if we stopped the season right now and see what these matchups will look like, who would beat who, and who would end up in the NBA Finals and eventually become the NBA champion. So stay with us. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. SMCpodcast.com for more info.
Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. We just broke down the Eastern Conference. Um, one through six are extremely competitive, some of the better teams in the NBA. But then after that, it's kind of a toss-up for whoever wants the last two playoff spots. I don't think any of those teams, with whether it be the Brooklyn Nets, Orlando Magic, Wizards, Bulls, Hornets, definitely not the Pistons in the bottom half, definitely not. But if any of them make it to the playoffs, I don't think they'll make any serious noise. That top six, though, are extremely competitive. That top six could go on and win an NBA championship. Um, the Milwaukee Bucks have been the most consistent team in the NBA, only lost eight times this year. And the Toronto Raptors as well, defending champions, played really well, really outdone themselves in the rebuild year without Kawhi Leonard. Really not a rebuild year, but kind of like a pivot, really. They've done a really good job of staying competitive. And so now, if we stop the playoffs right now and just played it out and saw, you know, one through eight battle it out as of right now, this is how it would look. The Lakers would match up against the Grizzlies. I think this could be a fun matchup for the Grizzlies to gain some experience and really show how competitive they can be, but I don't think they would have enough to be able to outlast the Lakers, who have only lost 12 games this year. The Grizzlies have a very young core, like I said, and they could be very competitive in the next coming years, but right now, the Lakers are on a quest to win a championship. Their window is small with you know, Anthony Davis potentially being injury prone with LeBron James aging each year. And their whole roster really is a bunch of older players. So I think their window is now and they're really going to make a push for that playoff. So the Lakers would beat the Grizzlies. The Nuggets would be matched up against the Mavericks. Um, this would be a great matchup in my opinion. And a one I think that the Mavericks could upset the Nuggets in. Only because the Ma- if the Mavericks are 100% healthy with Luka Doncic and Porzingis playing together, then yes, I think those two, as a tandem, could carry the Mavericks over the Nuggets, potentially. Just because I never want to count out the star power of Luka Doncic and his ability to just take over games. And they added with the fact that Porzingis could be a walking double-double and also a great rim protector as well, matched up against Jokic. It could be a good matchup for them. And I don't see any serious, serious outpouring from the Nuggets to combat Doncic's but the only reason why I would give this to the Nuggets is because they're just a little deeper in terms of their roster so I could see potentially an upset from the Mavericks but I'm gonna go with the safe route and say that the Nuggets would beat the Mavericks in seven um and then another matchup would be the Clippers versus the Thunder Thunder have had a great year this year but their year would end (laughs) against the Los Angeles Clippers because Kawhi Leonard is a different animal in the playoffs so is Paul George if he's healthy at the time um and those two playing together along with Harrell coming off the bench Lou Williams coming off the bench Marcus Morris at this point hopefully being more acclimated to his surroundings and really understanding his role um and this team could be extremely dangerous moving forward in the playoffs so Clippers over the Thunder even though the Thunder have great pieces in Chris Paul who could really help them move forward Shea Gillick's Alexander I think is a little young to to an experience as of right now to make a true impact and then after that you have Danilo Gallinari and Schroeder coming off the bench too but at the end of the day I think the Clippers are a little deeper and just a little more experienced and a little bit better as well so I think the Clippers would end up being the Thunder Um, and then the Jazz versus the Rockets in the in the last matchup for the West that would be the biggest matchup in my opinion I think it would be extremely fun to watch. It'd be uh, a fireworks show for sure. I think I'm going to lean towards the Utah Jazz just because I feel like they're they have more team chemistry with them. For the Rockets, it's two stars. It's Russell Westbrook and it's James Harden. Those two, they'll go off. They'll play really well. Eric Gordon could really um, help out as well. P.J. Tucker too. But I just feel like the Jazz have more chemistry to them Mike Conley could really show up in the playoffs Donovan Mitchell can really show up in the playoffs Rudy Gobert's rim protection is going to be vital in a matchup like that and they just have a little more pieces to really be successful I think so slimly I think that the Jazz would outlast the Houston Rockets and then looking at the Eastern Conference it's the Bucks versus the Magic 
and I don't even think I really need to break that down. I think the Bucks would completely sweep them. It it wouldn't even be competitive in my opinion, just because of the way that the Bucks have played this season. They would beat any team that's in front of them. Um, and with the Magic in front of them, the way that the Magic have played this year, it'd probably be yeah, it'd be a sweep for sure. So the Bucks would move on easily in the first round. Raptors versus the Nets, kind of the same situation. The Nets can be a competitive team. They've sh- they've proven it. They've shown it against the Raptors team this season. But the problem for me is that when it comes playoff time, players just seem to play different, play better. And like I said before, the Raptors have that championship DNA to them. I didn't even mention the fact that they have Serge Ibaka too, who's playing fantastic this year in an extended role. And then Kyle Lowry, he's already been there. Pascal Siakam's already been there. This team has already been there. So I think this would be a pretty easy round for them as well. And they'd dust off the Nets, no no problem. A matchup that I think, the last two matchups are a little more entertaining in my opinion. Celtics versus the Pacers. I think the Pacers could really push the Celtics to the edge. By the end of the day, the Celtics, their, their depth would be just too much. And I think that they would end up beating the Pacers probably in six games, maybe seven games, because that's just how competitive the Pacers are. But the Celtics just have a little more more talent and could definitely outlast the Pacers, in my opinion. And then the Heat versus the 76ers. These two teams are a great matchup. And I think at the end of the day, the Heat would probably end up victorious just because of how gritty they are and just a little more competitive they are. And I don't think that the Sixers have enough team chemistry, team identity to really know how to break down this Heat team that's been so competitive been so consistent they have a great system and great coaching staff um and they added pieces like andre iguodala and jay crowder so they're making a push for the playoffs right now and if they end up playing each other in the playoffs i just think that the heat would outlast the sixers and the sixers season would kind of be you know something that they need to look at and need to redesign themselves on because if they're going to commit to the whole ben simmons joel and bead matchup um, in terms of them moving forward, they're going to have to figure out a way to for them to play better together, and I just don't think that they'll beat this Heat team that's played this well so far. Now, moving forward in this playoff picture, if the, that first round that I said really comes to fruition, the next would be the Lakers versus the Jazz, which would be a really great matchup, and I think that the Lakers obviously would outstand them, in my opinion, just because they have LeBron James, who is somebody that's just unstoppable in the playoffs Anthony Davis as well I think he has a lot to prove for himself and they just have a lot more I think a lot more consistency to them a lot more competitiveness a lot more experience and I think that that's going to catch up to the Jazz in the end and I think the Lakers will end up beating the Jazz if this happens and then the Clippers versus the Nuggets this one would be a little bit closer a little bit tougher but like I said, at the end of the day, the Clippers, they know when to turn it on. Kawhi Leonard um, is the best player in this matchup, no doubt. I think Jokic could have a big impact in this matchup, but the Clippers have an all-defensive team. If Harrell is playing to his full ability, if Patrick Beverly is, is bothering you know Jamal Murray, I think he can really limit the team. They can really limit the Nuggets as a whole. And so I think that at the end of the day, the Clippers will end up beating the Nuggets. And then looking at the other side, the Bucks versus the Heat, this is a big matchup in my opinion because there is a lot of star power. And the Heat, for, for me, seem to have a lot more depth in terms of their squad. I mean, Jimmy Butler, Kendrick Nunn, Tyler Hero, even though they're both rookies, could still be really good in the playoffs. And then Andre Iguodala, he brings a lot of value to the team. Even though he doesn't necessarily score a lot, his numbers do go up a lot in the playoffs. And just his impact as a player on the court his plus minus is crazy, always. Jay Crowder as well. He's a great defensive player. I think the Heat could potentially beat the Bucks, but I think they'll push him to seven games in this one. But eventually the Bucks will win the win the series just because I think Giannis is a man on a mission, and I think he's a man that is not going to be stopped. And so at the end of the day, Giannis will take over, and the Bucks will make it again to the Eastern Conference Finals. On the other side is Celtics versus Raptors. This is another huge, huge matchup. Another 
matchup, I think, would go seven games. Because, like I said, that defending championship mentality, once you have that championship DNA, you're just different. And the Toronto Raptors have proven that time and time again. But I think at the end of the day, the Celtics are looking to prove themselves a lot, have really built a great roster, a great deep roster. And even though they're a little more inexperienced in the playoffs, I think in seven games, the Celtics would beat the the Raptors. Jason Tatum really would establish himself like he did last postseason, having to take over games when Kyrie went down. Gordon Hayward would revitalize himself, really prove that he deserves to be there. Kemba Walker, too, you know, never really been part of that playoff picture, competitively at least. I mean, on the Hornets, he never really did much. But on the Celtics, I think he could take over. And I think even with the rising star of Pascal Siakam, Van Vliet, the consistency of Kyle Lowry, and you know the resurgence of Serge Ibaka, I think the Celtics at the end of the day would take them down. So now looking at the Western Conference Finals, that would be the Lakers versus the Clippers. I think for sure, no matter what scenario it is, this is going to happen unless somehow the Clippers fall in the standings and they end up playing the Lakers in a second round matchup. But this is what the the Western Conference matchup should be. It's what everyone wants to see. And I think in six, maybe seven games, it's going to be the Clippers that end up beating the Lakers because of just how well equip, equipped they are to handle the Lakers. And they're younger too. They have a good balance between veterans, young players, and stardom. I mean, they have Kawhi Leonard. They have Paul George, Harrell, Lou Williams, Shamit. I didn't even mention him at all yet. They have a lot of good pieces, and I think the way that they are defensively, if they can turn it on and find that team chemistry, they can stop the Los Angeles Lakers. The Lakers have bigger star power. I mean, not bigger, but LeBron James is more decorated. Not by much, because him and Kawhi kind of cancel each other out. Paul George and Anthony Davis kind of cancel each other out. And so you look at their bench, their ability to play as a team, and I think at the end of the day... I think the Clippers just have a little bit more than the Lakers do. So I think the Clippers end up beating the Lakers in six or seven games, end up going to the NBA Finals, and end up dominating the Western Conference for the next couple years. And on the other side, the Bucks versus the Celtics, another game I think would go six or seven games. And for me, I want to go with the Celtics because I feel like I want them to win this eastern conference finals because of just how good they are and how much they've grown over the last couple years but the problem is the bucks they just don't seem like they can ever be beaten and a lot of it is because like i keep consistently saying Giannis is just an unstoppable force so the nba finals would end up being the milwaukee bucks and the los angeles clippers i know a lot of people are going to peg it the other way with the los angeles lakers versus the bucks but at the end of the day on the eastern side, it's probably going to be the Bucks in the finals. Doesn't really matter who's on the other side because the Bucks are going to be the NBA champions this year. I mean, just look at their record. They've only lost eight times this whole season. They've been that consistent, and no one has been able to find a way to stop Giannis. The only time I've really seen it is Joel Embiid kind of locking him down, but you don't really have players like that spread across the league. I think Anthony Davis could be a good piece to push against him but like i said i think it's gonna be the clippers that end up going to the finals so who are you gonna put on him harrell i mean maybe Kawhi leonard can slow him down a little bit he did it before um he did it last season with the raptors but i think this bucks team has just improved year after year and after last year's exit before the nba finals they went back and they became even better even more unstoppable so at the end of the day i think that's probably how it's going to end the NBA champions this year, an early season guess is that the Milwaukee Bucks will be the NBA champions. Coming up next, we're going to break down who is leading the MVP race, the defensive player of the year race, rookie of the year, and most improved player. Stay with us. (laughs) 
Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. We just broke down what the NBA playoffs would look like if it, the season had ended right now. And now moving forward, we're going to talk about the MVP, Rookie of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year, and honorable mention in the most improved. MVPs for me right now, Giannis Atentacumpo. And that's the end of the list. No, I'm just kidding. Because there's a lot of options. There are a lot of options. Giannis has played really well this season, been the most unstoppable player in the league. But there are other players who have played really well as well. Obviously, you have Giannis as a front runner just because of the, his numbers, averaging 30 points, over 10 rebounds, um, a good amount of steals and blocks as well. He's, their record is 46-8. and eight. He's on the best team in the, in the NBA. So he's a clear front runner, but there are other players in the NBA that played really well this season. Luka Doncic for me, kind of fallen back a little bit in this MVP race early on in the season when he had the Mavericks at number at number two, number three, number four, what have you, averaging almost a triple double. He did average a triple double in November when he was playing at his peak. He could be considered as one of the MVPs as well. Since his injury, since Porzingis' injury injuries. The Mavericks have fallen off a lot. Powell's injury as well has helped them fall off. They're in seventh right now, and even though he's playing at an elite level, when your team has a poor record, it's kind of going to be frowned upon to you as well. Just look at Bradley Beal not making the all-star team. But yeah, he's playing at an elite level too. Definitely could be in that conversation. LeBron James is another one. With the Lakers team being as unstoppable as they have, 41-12, and second best team in the NBA. And... His improved play as a point forward is truly inspiring. I mean, he's a player that people feared on the offensive end, and I think his best attribute is his passing at this point. I mean, he averages over 10 assists per game. I think he averages the most assists per game in the league. So for that to be his best attribute is pretty shocking to hear. Another player worth mentioning is James Harden, of course, because of the way that he's been playing this year. Averaging over 35 points per game, which is absolutely unheard of. He's just an elite, elite scorer, and it's almost impossible to stop him. (laughs) I mean, the way that he plays, he could beat you 1v1. He could beat you in transition. He has a million different ways to beat you one-on-one and find the bucket. And he also has improved a lot as a playmaker, too. Um, He doesn't get triple double numbers like his running mate Russell Westbrook but he does post up some good numbers in the assist column as well I think over six so he's the main reason why the Rockets are as competitive as they are only in fifth right now I think a little underperforming but he's had a fantastic year this year so as of right now the MVP would definitely go to Giannis no doubt about that but there are other players that have been very competitive in this aspect as well now moving forward, we're talking about the rookie of the year. This is a two-man race, and it's been a two-man race from the beginning, even though one of them wasn't even racing to begin with. John Morant is playing extremely well for a first-time player in the NBA. He's got the Memphis Grizzlies, who a lot of people thought were going to be in the bottom of the bracket in this Western Conference. He's got them at eighth place right now in a playoff spot. That's how well he's playing, how well they're playing as a team. They're 28 and 26. They're over 500. Just recently got to that milestone. And he's doing it all over the floor. And he's consistently proving people wrong as well. 
The biggest memory that stands out to me is when he faced up against James Harden. And the way that James Harden was kind of guarding him was a little disrespectful in ways because he would back off him around the the arc. He was kind of trash talking him. And John Morant, time after time, took it to him. And he took it to him and took it to him. I mean, he was just playing that well. He took over that game and ended up beating the Rockets um, during a time where they were just one of the hottest teams in the NBA and made this push into being a playoff team, a formidable opponent. And John Morant's, you know, he's got a lot of great attributes. I mean, he's not the best shooter, but he has consistently improved this season. He's an aggressive player, can get to the rim and dunk it on anybody. Um, And he's just a fierce competitor. He, he fears no one. And to prove that even more, he, he goes off off the court as well and you know he goes at guys like Andre Godala and Stephen Curry he fears no one so I think that has a lot of value in its in and itself and so he's the reason why for me he's the rookie of the year the only reason why this is a conversation though is because Zion Williamson was supposed to be the NBA headline of the year the thing to look out for the thing to watch but he's been injured pretty much all season long and so it's really just given the spotlight to John to John Morant all season long. But with Zion playing as well as he has over his first 10 NBA games, he's brought this conversation back just because of how much hype he has surrounding him. Zion is a generational talent already. You can you can see it. You can see the pieces he's already putting together to make himself a great player. He's already averaging over 20 points per game, almost averaging 10 boards. And he just had back-to-back 30-point games. He's got himself in conversations with Michael Jordan, um, with great players like Luka Doncic, um, and other players as well, because of just his all-around ability to be a great basketball player. His explosiveness is unparalleled, I think, and in my opinion, to anyone that I've seen. The way that he's as heavyset as he is, but still as athletic, as explosive as he is, is un- unheard of and a lot of the times when he gets rebounds he gets offensive rebounds he gets his own shots to put him back up and he's shot the ball very very efficiently at over 50 or 60 percent this season so this is the only reason why that there's still somewhat of a discussion but at the end of the day in this two-man race it's been one person running the whole season so in my opinion you got to give it to john morant no question, no matter what Zion does, the only way Zion beats John Morant in this race is if somehow in this back half, Zion pushes the Pelicans to the next level and knocks the Grizzlies out of a playoff space. And so I think if the Pelicans end up making that AC, the Grizzlies fall off, and Zion is the big reason why, then that conversation can become more realistic. But as of right now, as of this second, John Morant is the Rookie of the Year, no questions asked. Now we're going to talk about the Defensive Player of the Year. And for a lot of the season, when I've been watching, for me, it's been Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis is just, he's so lengthy. He can guard one through five because of his athleticism. And he's a big reason why the Lakers are so formidable on the defensive end. Him and LeBron James, that's a crazy tandem on either side of the court. But AD... Even though he's not a true center, he's a stretch five, really. Um, He is a great rim protector as well. And like I said, can guard one through five. But there are other players who are deserving of this, like Rudy Gobert, Gobert, who's back-to-back two-time defensive player of the year. He can get it three times in a row. Because like I said earlier, he's the reason why the Utah Jazz's defense is as good as it is. His ability to protect the rim is unparalleled in the NBA. Um, just his presence, his length, his ability to go out and get a block and just really contest players as well. I think players that go up against him in, you know, at the cylinder, their field goal percentages can't be good. Can't be that good because getting it over him is tough. And he's got great, uh, footwork as well to get into good positions, to be successful and get blocks. And so having already won it twice before, you really don't even need to make an argument for why he has to, why he gets to win it again, because he's just been that good, that consistent. Another player who I think could win this is Giannis. Giannis is another player. I mean, 
just look at the all-star game i thought that was insane no one plays defense in an all-star game but for him he was competing harder than anyone i saw other than kyle lauer who kept trying to win some charges but back to Giannis, he's the only player i think that can shut down lebron james can shut down anthony davis and he showed it even in an all-star game which i thought was crazy and another reason why that this all-star format would probably take it it does look like they're going to end up staying with this new format in terms of getting to a set score to win because it made them that competitive it made Giannis go hard in the paint against lebron blocked him hard in the paint against anthony davis blocked him so in an mvp year Giannis is also getting it done on the defensive end as well and can definitely win this Defensive Player of the Year in addition to his MVP already. And now real quickly, we're going to talk about most improved. Got to mention Devontae Graham from the Charlotte Hornets. He's playing really well this season. Um, He's a good uh, person to pair with Terry Rozier as well. Charlotte Hornets are not good by any means this season, but to have these two kind of budding stars start to find good chemistry together um, is good for them for the future moving forward. And I think Devontae Graham's really, you know, made a great improvement in his play this season, really starting to gain some confidence, gain some ability to be successful in this league. Another player for me is Brandon Ingram, who, you know, went to this Pelicans team and he finally got to become the man. I mean, at the Lakers, there was a lot of times where he had to defer, and I think for the Pelicans, that's not the case. He's their first option, and he's their go-to. He's a first-time All-Star this year, and he's playing really well, and he's a big reason why I think this Pelicans team can make a push for that last playoff spot. Um, Shea Gilgus Alexander, another player who got traded from the Clippers, um, and it ended up working out really well for the Thunder, too. They lost Paul George, obviously, so they kind of lose that trade, but getting a young player in Shea Gilgus Alexander and the way that he's playing this year is a big plus for them because he's made a lot of strides to be one of the more dangerous players in the league. Now he just needs to find a way to be doing that consistently. And then last but not least, I saw this written in an article the other day, Luka Doncic. Could Luka Doncic be the most improved player of the year? I mean, you think it's crazy because, well, you kind of expect him to be a great star, but he's only in his second year. And to go from you know a great role player to superstardom just like that in just one year, after one year in the NBA, he's this good already. I kind of had to sit there and think about that for a second and thought, that's a great point. <laughs> Luka Doncic is already this good in the NBA? It's kind of unheard of. So I think even he could potentially be overlooked for uh, most improved player of the year just because of you kind of expect it, but you shouldn't. You know what I mean? So... I feel like he could be somebody that should be talked about but won't be talked about. And now that's going to do it for our podcast. So thank you for listening to the GSMC Basketball Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review because that really helps us out. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I would greatly appreciate that. I'm Isaiah Kidos. Thank you and see you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program